book by looking at the cover. Thanks, Bo. Proof once again that Bo knows. Words that are worth heeding if you're thinking you're going to see the Cordis Green coming down to the National, because the play title gives no allusion whatsoever to its content, and I worry for those expecting a night of agriculture, colour psychology, or podiatry. Well, just the National after all, that they may be very let down. Good to have a The foundations for this story come from William's own school days in North Wales. Specifically, it is inspired by the influence of one teacher, Miss Cook, who nurtured his talent uh, for learning and language. She ultimately helped Williams leave Wales by getting a place at Oxford University, leading to a life in London as a, as a writer and actor. A nice enough story. A dull play. In the corner's green, uh, Williams makes the hurrah for education the central point in what is certainly not a comedy. He attempts to unpick connotations around tradition, self betterment and xenophobia in its original definition. The voiceover may be something like how one strong woman helped one overlooked boy develop his talent, leave mining behind him and become the star he was born to be. If that sounds a bit little Billy Elliot, that's because it is. Go back a hundred years, swap ballet, shoes for books, swap, swap Newcastle for a mining village in Wales, and swap Elton John for ten men in a Welsh male voice choir. Feel free to write your own tabloid headline there. I can handle half the tenors in a male voice choir. I think many already have. So ultimately you could have this as Billy Elliot 1885. The preboot. Perhaps. Emphasising the semi rather than the autobiographical, Williams morphs himself into 15-year-old Morgan Evans. Before we discover Evans' natural talent, he is painted as a, a typical cheeky rapscallion, asking strange ladies he meets for, meets for a kiss twice. And he has a sad backstory, working in the mines and living alone since his entire family died five years ago. Very X Factor. In his professional debut, Ewan Davis does well to convey the loneliness of this child forced into adulthood, but he is restricted by a part that is, like most here, woefully underwritten. For his final act emotionally rousing speech, the character can't have said more than a dozen lines. The main protagonist, unsurprisingly, is the Miss Cook inspired teacher, Miss Moffat. She arrives in the village. Uh, ready to spend her vast inheritance, it's seemingly endless, on educating children working in the mines. Miss Moffat is strong of opinion. She's middle-aged, wealthy and unmarried. All of which cause consternation for being traits better associated with a man. As such, her ambitions are thwarted from all sides. You may wonder what fuels her ambition. Or wonder why she chose this village or wonder why it's necessary to dress her in the high-waisted skirt, tight blouse and pull-back hair so often lazily used to represent 19th century lesbians. All good questions. I have no answers. The role of Miss Moffat has been played by the likes of Sybil Thorndike and Ethel Barrymore in the original London and Broadway cast respectively. Catherine Hepburn and Cicely Tyson in 1980's Revivals, and Beth Davis in the 1948 film and short-lived musical that followed. Adding to that list, here we have Nicola Walker, best known for quality TV dramas like Unforgotten, The Split, and my own personal favourite, Spooks. Basically, if it's a popular drama on 9pm on any channel, Nicola Walker is likely to be in it. Stylistically, Walker is quite different to those other actors listed. Her, performance, her performances are more controlled and nuanced. She works with text to make it sound effortlessly natural, not like that. It's easy to forget the mastery behind her skill. Walker is adept at bringing characters to life through the smallest of facial expressions. Her performances draw you in. Perversely, they mean, this means they, and she, also rarely stand out. 
She's always excellent, but never showy. It is a welcome return to Walker, who last performed at the National ten years ago in The Curious Incident. But it's disappointing that the play she returns in falls way short of her ability. Not long into the play, and after not too many barriers, Miss Moffat is already about to give up on her plans due to the opposition face. Clearing through the, the classroom, she comes across a left-behind school book and reads a poem. But this includes the lines, When I walk through the... where the corn is green. It's a moment that changes everything. The line reignites her belief in an education for every child, and specifically, an education for its writer, Morgan Evans. And it also finally gives us relevance to the play's title. Now, for this conceit to work, we as the audience must accept the metaphor has a spark of genius to it, that is, it has come from the pen of a writer whose talents are equitable, or maybe equitable, to the likes of Shakespeare or Tennyson. This much we are told. It only feels a little odd when you ground it in the truth. And remember that Williams, the writer, wrote this line and described it to the character based on his child self. He then wrote the, the exaltation and assumptions of talent that were given to this writer. And then to blur things a little bit more, he used this metaphor as the name of the play. It somehow feels like writing his own history and blurring fact and fantasy a little. And so the rest of the play passes quickly with the villagers getting on board, the class is growing and, and all about trying to get the boy into Oxford with a couple of hiccups along the way. Most of the studying is done off stage. Passing the time the supporting cast generally do their best with the scraps they have to work with. From the village, we have the squire, Rufus Wright, who wheezes and flusters as though being flashed a pair of breasts before every other sentence. Alice, or Ewing, does her best to make us not quite hate Miss Rombury as much as we want to. The clueless, simpering assistant teacher in an array of ill-fitting frocks, always ready to take a beating if that's what the gentleman requires. And Mr Jones, who we are told is in conflict between his Welsh heritage and his knowledge of the English language and the promise that that upholds to him. This conflict isn't really demonstrated, but Richard Lynch does seem permanently exasperated behind his plentiful, assumedly stuck-on facial hair, which may also act as the beard for his... paedophile tendencies that are alluded to later on in the play. Arriving with Miss Moffat uh, on the other side is her housekeeper Mrs Watty. She's an ex-thief born as a Salvation Army captain. It's a character from musicals that lacks belief and Joe McKinnis can do little else but play her for laughs. Saffron Coomba as Mrs. Watty's daughter Bessie gives a performance that seems off kilter to the others. It feels somewhat unnatural and lacks self belief, as though Akuma herself was a late addition to the cast. But one wonders, to be fair, whether less time has been spent on this character, even subconsciously. Bessie is a horrible reminder of the time the play this was written. Perhaps it's easier to look away than to deal with the necessary repugnancy. The character of Bessie epitomises the, the results of the male gaze at its worst. She is a one-dimensional female character written by a man solely to be cast as villain. She has given no depth to her and is at times a liar, a thief, a blackmailer, a gossip, a bitch and ultimately a whore. She is written without any empathy. Her supposedly devout Christian mother wishes she'd never been born. And no one back denied it. Others refer to her as vile, inhuman, unworthy of redemption or time. 
pretty fierce statements to say about a teenage girl. Her flirtatiousness is put as to blame for the old man's sexual attraction. And when she falls pregnant, that is her fault. The play obviously pertains to challenging uh, stereotypes of the time. But it's this writing of Bessie that reminds us just how deeply intrinsic sexism was back then. The hypocrisy it displayed would be laughable, but I worry it still passes us by unnoticed. Even a 21st century audience today, I think, will likely leave the play feeling only resentment for Bessie. And that should worry us all. In a slightly odd creative twist, director Dominic Cook has added the role of Emblyn Williams, the author, to the cast. He remained on stage throughout the action, speaking lines, making edits to the text as they go, and reading stage directions around the actors. At the beginning, when there's very little set on stage, he describes the stage for us. It makes us focus on the quality of the text. It's a bad idea. It also gives sense that the play is fresh from development. The worst idea. It feels as if it was great in rehearsal days. Someone should have culled it before it got so laboured. It is a meta mishit. Every year around this time, the National puts on some forgotten play that's set, set around the 1900s. Most years, it just reminds us why it has been forgotten. Paper-thin characters, laboured uh, text, flimsy plots and outdated sexism, it, they just aren't what we need to keep the theatre alive. On the bright side, it is a genuine joy to see the talents of Nicola Walker on stage again. We just pray that next time, let it be sooner and let it be in a vehicle that has a quality befitting her talent.